At Online Med Ed, we walk you through every topic in detail so you're ready for the boards and the wards. In this lesson on psych pharmacology, we're going to focus on the antidepressants and we're going to focus on their use in depression, even though we know that some of these medications can be used for other disorders. What I want to do is first review depression treatment in general and then go through each individual class, paying attention to its side effect profile and how you might use these medications for an alternative diagnosis, not depression, but also not even in psychiatry. So we're talking about antidepressants. And antidepressants are used to treat depression. The working theory for depression is that of the monoamine hypothesis. which basically says people who are depressed don't have enough happy neurotransmitters. And we, we went for a long time thinking that this was predominantly norepinephrine. And so the early medications went after norepi. We then realized that we should be focusing primarily on serotonin. And so we made serotonin selective medications. Then we realized, oh, hey, it's probably not just one or the other. We should probably combine them. And the most recent medications are those that combine them both. The idea is that neurotransmitters equate to mood. And those people who are depressed have low neurotransmitters and therefore a depressed mood. And if all we need to do then is increase the amount of neurotransmitter there and we'll end up increasing their mood. It's a great theory, but it's not true. If that were true, we would see a huge effect upon starting the medication. We do see a benefit of starting a medication, but rarely is it better than placebo in the first couple of weeks. So then we start to thinking, okay, what else must be happening on a longer scale? And that is plasticity. The brain is trapped in G0, right? If it dies, it can't regenerate. But neurons that are stimulated are more likely to increase the synaptic connection between other neurons. The idea is if you block reuptake of neurotransmitter, you stimulate neurons more. And those that are being stimulated form more connections. They're plastic, they change, and they upregulate their sensitivity to happy feelings. I know it's a bit of a stretch, but the idea is it's not just the amount of neurotransmitter, it's also the effect over time, which leads to the real benefit of improving mood. And we know that is true because it takes a couple of weeks to really see the effect. So then how do you choose the drug? How do you know if you've got the right one? It's basically going to be a trial and error. But the answer is almost always going to be an SSRI or an SNRI. This gets frustrating because you basically just have to pick one, try it out, see how it goes. If the side effects are bad and the patient can't tolerate it, try another one. To help you on this, there's a rule of sixes. You want to attempt a single dose for six weeks to see if it is effective or not. Six weeks to see if the person feels better. It's a long time to wait, but that's what you're supposed to do. If someone comes back a week later and says, hey, this isn't working, your response should be, let's keep going where we are. Once you find an effective dose, you need to treat depression for six months. before you consider stopping it. Even if their mood improves, this is getting back into the plasticity thing, we want them on the medications longer, long-term, to get the most benefit. And this, the, not, the last one is not so much, it's just to make the advanced organizer work, you really need more like three weeks, but six weeks of washout. Washout was a big deal when our medications were nonspecific. The idea was you didn't want to combine the mechanism of action of two medications because that would lead to syndromes of overdose, serotonin syndrome, for example. What you'll see in clinical practice is a lot of people double up the SSRIs because they're so selective. 
but for the test, even though it's a bit archaic, you still wanna look for the period of washout. That is, if you're gonna stop one medication, wait three to six weeks before you start another one. And the goal is to get the maximum dose. And you limit your dosing based on the side effect profile. But always remember in treating depression, the combination of psychotherapy and medications is far better than therapy or medications alone. So all the while they're on this, you're still gonna see them in the office helping them through their stressor. Antidepressants are really frustrating because even though they are divided into classes, they don't share a suffix. So you just have to memorize the names of the drugs in each class. What I want you to do is we're gonna build a chart. What I want you to do is every time you encounter a medication, say the class and all the medications in it. What I've done here is chosen the commonly prescribed medications and the ones you're gonna see often on the test. They all sound alike. So you have to keep them compartmentalized in a drug class that leads to a name rather than trying to memorize name, 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 name and go back to the class. Let's see what I mean. The first class is the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, the SSRIs. And when I say SSRI, I think of escitalopram, fluoxetine, paroxetine, and sertraline. The SSRIs, they all have various side effect profiles, but the thing you should take away is sexual dysfunction. There may be a decreased libido, desire to have sex, but there may also be prolonged ejaculation. That is, these medications can be abused so that a man maintains his erection longer to continue their sex sexual intercourse. The SNRIs, serotonin and norepinephrine reptake inhibitors, are going to be desvenlafaxine and duloxetine. The SNRIs tend to be better and cleaner they just cost more money. An SSRI or an SNRI is always the right answer. If you have to pick, you should not have to choose between them. It's where you get into these other drug classes that you're going to find really testable information. For example, the atypicals, of which there's only one I want you to learn, bupropion. Bupropion is good at helping people quit smoking. And even though they quit, they don't gain weight. But they cannot be used, they are never used in bulimia because they decrease the seizure threshold. They also happen to have the lowest in the way of sexual side effect dysfunction. So bupropion can be chosen if someone has a little bit of depression and is trying to quit smoking. The serotonin modulators are actually pretty crappy antidepressants. Nirtazapine and trazodone. So much so that they're more used for their side effect than they are their primary treatment. Trazodone has such high somnolence that we actually use it as a sleep aid and it is almost never used as an antidepressant. Be aware that trazodone can also cause priapism, which is a medical emergency. Mirtazapine is an antidepressant, better than trazodone, but not as good as an SSRI, but it is also an appetite stimulant. So patients who are underweight and need to gain weight while they treat their depression can be started on mirtazapine. I'm gonna put a big black bar here because above this bar are medications that are actually used to treat depression. Below this bar are gonna be medications that were used to treat depression, but generally are gonna be the wrong answer. First class here are the tricyclic antidepressants. These were the triptylenes. But don't forget about imipramine and doxepin. 
tricyclics are such dirty drugs with horrendous side effect profiles that generally we use them for their side effects, not for the primary treatment of depression, much like we do the serotonin modulators. We can use these tricyclics to treat enuresis, especially in kids, because the acetylcholine side effects of urinary retention prevent the kid from bedwetting. Where you're gonna see tricyclics used the most is going to be in the treatment of neuropathic pain, especially in the way of diabetic neuropathy. But if you see a test question about a TCA, you're probably going to get asked about the three C's, which is going to be convulsions, cardiac toxicity, and coma. That is, it causes altered mental status, prolonged QT, and other arrhythmias, and it can cause seizures. And lastly, one that is never used and is always the wrong answer is the MAOIs, selegiline and phenylzine. This is a throwback to pharmacology, and the only time you'll see this is in relation to a hypertensive emergency. especially when the patient eats wine or cheese. It's a product of tyramine, which happens to act in a similar way. And so effectively, you double up the medication, increase the amount of norepi, leading to a hypertensive crisis. So antidepressants are about going slow. Increase the dose only after a long trial period at the dose. Once you find a dose that works, keep them on it for a long time, even after they feel better. And if you stick with the old dogma, you need to have washout to avoid overlapping medications leading to things like hypertensive crisis or serotonin syndrome. The right answer is always going to be SSRIs or SNRIs. You should not have to choose between them, except in the case of where you use bupropion for smoking cessation or as the precipitant for seizures in a bulimic patient. Mirtazapine, appetite stimulant, trazodone, sleep aid, tricyclics used to treat neuropathic pain, MAOIs, never the right answer. That is antidepressants. In this lesson in the Psych Farm series, we're gonna talk about mood stabilizers. In the mood disorders lesson, we kept it simple and kinda of clung to some of the old school thought to make it really easy. I'm gonna say some of the things that probably aren't going to be tested, but are definitely in the forefront of the way we're treating mood disorders. So you may see this change in the next two to three years. And what's on in this lesson is going to be what's coming as a definitive therapy. Let me show you what I mean. Previously, we just treated chronic mania. That is bipolar disorder, what we now call maintenance. And we had this hierarchy of medications. Choose this one first, then this, then this, then this, in order to achieve maintenance. But now we usually see people come in with an acute manic episode who get some sort of treatment and then need to be progressed into chronic management. The thought process is whatever regimen you've got them under control on should be the medication you keep them on for maintenance. The problem with that argument is you may need multiple medications that are opening up to multiple side effects. It used to be we should just put them on the smallest number of medications to avoid drug interactions to keep them under control. That's why this is sort of in flux. So what we know now is still going to piggyback on what we taught in that mood disorder lesson. In order to treat acute mania to get them into maintenance, you're either going to use lithium or valproic acid, valproate, combined with an antipsychotic usually a second generation or an atypical. And if you achieve control of the mania, you simply leave them on both medications, supposing that the patient can tolerate both medications without side effects. And what we've learned is that quetiapine in all phases of treatment is used to treat bipolar disorder. And this is the big change you're gonna see in the hierarchy medications. So let's talk about mood stabilizers one at a time. Still at the top of the list is lithium. It is one of the first line agents, as we just implied. The problem with lithium is that it is a really nasty drug, very potent, very effective, but has lots of side effects. It is a teratogen. 
and has a very narrow therapeutic index. It's nephrotoxic, and so it can cause renal failure, but also can cause nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. These are the things you're going to be most commonly tested on. But lithium works if it's stable. If you can't use lithium for whatever reason, valproate or valproic acid is the other first-line agent. It too is a teratogen and the way of causing spina bifida. And while you can put a woman on prenatal vitamins, people who may not be mentally stable are at higher risk for either not complying with the contraception regimen or being taken advantage of and engaging in sexual promiscuity. So that means that valproic acid may not be the right choice for a woman, especially if she's trying to get pregnant, but it's still a first-line agent. Some other stuff that sometimes comes up is pancreatitis, decreased platelets, or full-blown agranulocytosis. This is the big switch. In that mood disorder lesson, we said lithium, valproate, then you can't be asked to choose between carbamazepine and lamotrigine. The way we're going is to choose between them. The big switch is that we insert quetiapine as a second line agent, either as an adjunct to valproate or lithium, or used if you can't use these. Being in a typical antipsychotic, you have to worry about things like weight gain. prolongation of the QTC, which means you have to get an EKG before starting. Quetiapine is known for its somnolence and can be used to treat insomnia, but is generally considered a side effect of treating mood disorders. And the other second-line agent is lamotrigine, which is generally considered second-line, and there's no side effect you have to remember because it's generally considered very clean. The other big switch was that they're trying to get rid of carbamazepine being used for mood stabilization. It can still be used on your test, but should be considered moving forward a third line agent. Instead, it should be used for its other indications, trigeminal neuralgia, which is Dick de la Rue, or absence seizures in kids. I haven't been totally truthful either. I've only talked about two phases of treatment, acute mania and maintenance. That's what I want you to focus on. Getting from acute mania to maintenance usually involves one of the first-line agents, lithium or valproate, combined with an atypical antipsychotic, probably quetiapine. If you can't use any of those, use lamotrigine. Try to get away from carbamazepine. That is mood stabilizers.